Okay. It's good in here. A little old fashioned tape recorder. <laughs> right. Uh, let's uh, turn to uh, Matthew's Gospel and the fifth chapter, and this should be all a very familiar portion of Scripture to us because it is known as Christ's Sermon on the Mount. And we'll read from the first verse. Now, when he saw the crowds, he, that, that is Jesus, went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, nor the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. And there reads the word. And I, uh, I like watching uh, MasterChef. I don't know if you, uh, you've seen that. We've got the celebrity one at the moment. I haven't even started watching that. I've only just finished the other one. Um, but uh, Lisa's forced to watch it with me um, just so that she can get some ideas of how to cook. So I've got to be careful what I say. <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, so MasterChef, people go on MasterChef to, because they love to cook, don't they? They love to cook and they love to make up different recipes and uh, they love to uh, experiment with uh, ingredients to bring out this one super dish, you know, this mm, bellissimo, lovely dish. So um, they, they have to make these recipes. Why? Because they love to do it, don't they? They love to do it. Um, they're always looking for that perfect, perfect dish. Um, and John and Greg, who, you know, who, uh, who do the show, um, after the chef has made this wonderful dish in their eyes, um, they'll taste it and they'll say, hmm, needs seasoning. It needs a bit of salt, a bit of pepper. Oh, Grandma loved salt. She absolutely loved salt. She used to whack salt on everything. And Lisa's going that way as well. She loves salt. You know, you've got to have salt and vinegar on your, on your, on your chips. Um, so salt. Um, and here this morning we're looking at this passage in uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And the title you have there is Salt and Light. And the Lord Jesus says, you are the salt 
of the earth. Um, yes, and why salt? That's a very good question, isn't it? Why salt? Um, and before that, we have to go back, don't we? Um, because as we read through that passage there, we notice that Christ says, um, he tells us here that Christians are the salt of the earth. So we have to look back. And we have to go and we have to look at what a true Christian is. So we need to see what a true Christian is. And as we read on, we'll see this. And what is a true Christian? So if you turn to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11 and verse 26, we see here. That then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for the whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So here we have our first record of Christians in the church. Uh, Why were they called Christians? Very simple question. Because they were followers of Christ, weren't they? Very simple question. Simple answer. They committed their lives to walk for Christ. Turn to 1 John. 1 John. And in 1 John. And in chapter 2, verse 6, we read, Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. And there it is. There it is in Scripture. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. It's truth is seen in him and you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. Amen. It's wonderful, isn't it? And again, it goes on, fathers. And if we turn to Ephesians 2, very, very um, famous passage in Ephesians 2 and verse, verse 8. Ephesians 2 and verse 8. And what does that say? By grace you have been saved, isn't it? Uh, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, works which God prepared in advance for us to do. So we have been saved by faith, haven't we? In Christ, not following any rules and not our own works. And then another wonderful passage is Romans. In Romans 10. In Romans 10 and verse 9, it says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Hallelujah. That's wonderful, isn't it? So a a Christian is is unashamed, is it? He's unashamed to say Jesus is Lord and and believes in his resurrection, doesn't he? Um, It's the most important thing to know, isn't it? Is the Lord Jesus. And we need to know that this morning, don't we? We need to know that this morning. 
Uh, what this Christian message is, well, it's the gospel, isn't it? It's the message of the gospel. It's the only message of hope. The only message of hope. So, going back then, why salt? Or the technical name is sodium chloride. Uh, salt, it, what, what's the characteristic? Salt has a peculiar taste, doesn't it? It has a peculiar taste of its own. It's utterly unlike anything else. You can't really, you know, you, you haven't got another taste to rival salt, have you? It's, it's, like, it, it's like nothing else. And if you look up about salt, it, it, says, it tells you this. It says, you will find that the human body um, requires 1.2 to 1.5 grams of salt per day. And that's to keep you alive. Too much and you die. Too little and you die. Amazing, isn't it? Um, eventually you die. Because actually in the USA, um, I think alone, that averages about 3.4 grams of salt. So uh, they eat a lot more salt than us Brits do, uh, which increases high blood pressure and increases your uh, chance of uh, cardiac arrest. So spiritual food, also watch your, uh, your earthly food as well. <laughs> um, but to those in the world, uh, we're peculiar, aren't we? We're peculiar to to people in the world. There goes those crazy Christians again, off to worship. Uh, What are they up to? Um, But it's it's a shame, isn't it? Because to the world, we are just another religion, aren't we? To the world, we are just a religion. Well, what's the difference? Well, religion isn't Christianity, is it? Religion isn't Christianity. Christianity is what Jesus has done. It's what Jesus is doing, and it's what Jesus has yet to do. God is acting. Hallelujah, isn't that wonderful? That God is acting. So religion then, it's to man, what it's the false idea of what man thinks the church is, isn't it? It's the false idea of what man thinks the church is. Man is outside the church because he doesn't know what true Christianity is. The greatest enemy of the true Christian church is religion. And it always has been. Always. It's, well, religion, is, it confuses the mind of men and women, doesn't it? It confuses them. So what do I mean by religion then? Well, Christianity, it's not a state religion, is it? It's not a religion of the state. It's not, official, it's not an official religion. But that's the, many, that's the idea that many people have of it, that it's a state religion. I mean, look at uh, certain great ceremonies, don't we? We look at uh, like a coronation or a, uh, a funeral of a, a great man, and um, it's just a ceremony, you know? I mean, back during the World War, they, they used to hold national days of prayer, didn't they? And, uh, but they had had no thought of Christ before. They had no thought of the gospel before. And yet when trouble comes, oh, we've got to hold a national day of prayer. Oh, but then when the trouble goes, they go back to their normal lives, don't they? They go back to their normal lives. But that's got nothing to do with Christianity. That's religion, folks, isn't it? That's religion. Uh, other formal occasions, you think of the christenings, don't you? You think of a christening, oh, they've never been to church. But then when they have a son or a daughter, oh, we've got to get them done. We've got to go and get them done. Because then they'll be safe. They'll be safe, won't they? And then they just go back to their normal lives as if they hadn't even thought about it. So sad, isn't it? Another wedding. You know, you have a wedding. Oh, I'd rather have a wedding in a church. Much more uh, ceremonial, much more, uh, <clears throat> much more dignity having it in a church rather than a registry office. It's nothing to do with Christianity, is it, folks? Christianity is not what the BBC seems to think it is. And that's so sad and true in this day and age, isn't it? It's so sad when you look at it. and they, The church is not a national institute. It's, it's not a club. You know, I think it's quite in, interesting and that uh, when I opened up, we were just changing accounts and changing over... Um, Yet you're, you're not classed as, as a church organisation. You have to open up as a society or a club in the world's eyes. It's so sad, isn't it? So sad. 
It's not a society where people come to de- together and do certain things. You know what I mean by that? A church is not a building. It's not a building, is it? It's not a building at all. It, the church is living souls with God in the midst of us. That, that is a church, isn't it? It's not a 9am service or a 10.30am service and then you can go and do your, 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 the rest of your stuff the rest of the day, go out. You know, enjoy yourselves for the rest of the day. That's not religion. That's not religion at all. It's the exact opposite of the Christian faith, isn't it? Religion is tradition. You, know, you hear these people say that, don't you? Uh, I mean, look at the Pharisees and their traditions. That's, uh, look at the churches of so called churches of today. It's very sobering, isn't it, when you think of that? And they're the true enemies of the true church. They're the true enemies of the Christian faith. So you have to ask yourself a serious question this morning, and it's a very serious question. Why do you attend a place of worship? Why? Why? Why do you do it? Is it a tradition to you? Do you do it because you've always done it? That's not Christianity. It's something you do. Something you do. You're following your tradition. You're doing your duty. You're doing your duty, aren't you? You going to church, you hope it's not going to be too long. (laughs) We've heard that so often, haven't we? You felt nothing. You go, you've gone, you felt nothing. It's a lifeless service. There's no life there. Miserable singing. You know, miserable. Thank the Lord we're not guilty of that here. Um, I think we could outsing, you know, uh, St. Paul's Cathedral any day. Any day. Hallelujah. But it's really sad though, isn't it? That, that there is, you know, it's miserable singing. It's, it's monotone scripture. Oh, good morning, dear friends. It's all that one monotone. There is no life there. No life, no power. Christ is not present. The Holy Spirit is not present. Well, so what do the world do then? What do they do? Oh, oh, oh. they compensate for it, don't they? Got to bring in entertainment, haven't we? We've got to liven things up a bit. We, what do we do to bring in young people? Oh, should we bring in some drums and some you know, electric guitars? And, you know? It's not Christ-centred. We've got to have a lively, bright service. Make people, no, we can't talk about death and hell. We can't talk about that. Too morbid. People will never come in. They'll never know. They change the laws, don't they? They change God's law. So sobering when we think of what has been going on these past few years in the church and about homosexual marriage and other things. And this doesn't change it at all, does it? Because man is central, isn't it? Man, anything that's controlled by man, is not true Christianity. Christianity is always the activity of God, isn't it? Always. So then, the Lord tells us here that we are to be salt, isn't he? He's to... So where are we? We've lost my place now. We are salt. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. So what are the other... Well, we are bought with the blood of Christ, aren't we? We are his salt. It's wonderful, isn't it? That's a wonderful thing. So what are the other characteristics of salt? It was quite interesting looking all this up. Um, the other characteristics of salt, it, it preserves, doesn't it? It preserves. Now, another programme we watch, I, mean, I don't want to say that we watch TV all the time, but um, <laughs> there is another programme that we watch. We quite like watching, obviously, Grand Designs. I've used that illustration before. But there's another one called The Restoration Man. And this chap, George Clark, he goes, you know, about different, uh, different places. But they're, they're very interesting buildings. You know, they're old churches or they're... 
um, really unusual, like there's a lighthouse or a, you know, a watchtower or something like that. Um, and on this particular occasion, he was in the, the high, highlands of Scotland, and he was right on the coast, and there was one chap, and he was, he was restoring this old Viking dwelling. And uh, in this Viking dwelling was uh, this, like, domed feature. And it was, it, was, it was probably about six foot above the ground, not, not very high at all. But then it went really deep into the ground, like 30 feet, and there was this small doorway, and there was this like uh, stairway, stone staircase into this like vast pit. Nothing in there. And of course, the Vikings used to use it to store all their food. So they put all the salt down there, salt and ice, and of course, it being underground, it kept its temperature, and it preserved the food. It preserved fish, meat, veg, other things. So it's interesting, isn't it, that salt preserves it preserves, and it preserves from corruption. And corruption, obviously, it means that there's no nasty bacteria getting into the food. But then it gives flavour as well, doesn't it? Salt gives flavour, as we've already seen. A little bit of salt, a little bit of seasoning, as we've already seen, it gives flavour. And it gives flavour to everything that it's mixed with. Everything that it's mixed with. It's amazing, isn't it? If you don't have salt, it's bland, isn't it? If you don't have salt, it can be bland. It needs a bit of salt. So you can taste the salt in it. So then we need to look at our spiritual states, don't we? And this is what the Lord Jesus is telling us to do here. If if a salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. We must continue, mustn't we, in our walk with Christ. And we must walk with him faithfully, mustn't we? We must walk with him faithfully. We must season those around us, mustn't we? We must keep a good testimony. So, so vital, isn't it, that we keep a good testimony. And that should be a question to all of us. Are we a good testimony? Are we a good testimony to people at work who know that we're a Christian? Or if they don't know we're a Christian... Do they, can they tell there's something different about us? Do we keep a good testimony to our loved ones? Are we firm in the word? We have to be, don't we, as Christians? Yes, we'll be put to trial. <laughs> we certainly will be put to trial, won't we? Uh, Christ uh, shows us this on many, many occasions. But don't lose your saltiness. Because the world is always watching, isn't it? A one slip. And the world says, call yourself a Christian, doing that. So true though, isn't it? So true. Just one slip. So then, just as salt preserves, we must preserve the word of God, mustn't we? We must be faithful in it. We must be faithful in it. Otherwise, the world tramples us, doesn't it? It tramples us underfoot. So secondly then, the Lord tells us that we are the light of the world. That's wonderful, isn't it? You are the light of the world. Well, why? Well, a lovely lovely passage here is Isaiah. Isaiah 9. And you should know this. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, A light has dawned. Hallelujah. Christ gave us light, didn't he? He is the light of life. Hallelujah. He is the light of life. Now, of all things created, light is the most useful, isn't it? It's the most useful thing that we could have. What are its characteristics? I mean... uh, Another thing I watch sorry, <laughs> um, is we watch um, oh, Running Wild. You know, you've never seen that? Bear Grylls. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. He's, he's uh, sort of you know, an SAS uh, veteran. He's climbed Everest and, and whatnot. But he does these survival shows, of course. And if you sort of, you know, 
I mean, we, we often, you know, go into a panic if we've lost a mobile phone, but um, he sort of goes right back to, you know, the primitive times where he's got a flint or a... Um, one I was watching the other night, um, he was in the outback of Australia, and, of course, he's parachuted into the, the Northern Territory. <laughs> you know, swamp, crocodile-infested swamps and uh, snake infests everywhere. Um, you know, and there he is. He, oh, I don't want to go into much detail, but he actually gets a huntsman spider, you know, gets the fangs off and eats it. Oh, crazy, crazy chap. But um, one thing he did was he started a fire from literally uh, a bit of wood and friction and an ember. And of course, in the darkness, even that ember gives light, doesn't it? That spark. And then when the fire comes into to life, it changes. It gives light. You can see. You can see what you're doing. So that is a characteristic. Even a small spark lights up darkness, doesn't it? Did you know that light fertilizes? It's a great fertilizer. Is light? <laughs> I've got a friend, Kev, our chef, who uh, who was with us for the barbecue. Um, he uh, he's been growing chili plants, and uh, he uh, he's a sort of stay-at-home dad. And uh, he's growing lots of things. But he gave me th- uh, three chilli plants. He gave me jalapeno pepper. He gave me cayenne pepper. And he gave me a scotch bonnet. Um, oh, yeah. So I put these, uh, these outside um, because, of course, plants need light and water, don't they? They need light and water. Um, so I watered them and uh, checked on them the next day. And the slugs had eaten pretty much all the leaves. So I had to bring the plants indoors. And bringing them indoors... They haven't got as much sunlight as they need. And of course, they're not doing as well as they could do outside. So light fertilises, doesn't it? It gives great fertiliser. But what else does light do? Well, it guides, doesn't it? Have you ever been in um, a power cut at home? In the, you know, at night time, you're watching something on the TV. Boom, the light, you know, the, the whole of the power goes. You look out, you can hear house alarms going off in the distance, can't you? It's always, it's always the first thing that you know that there's been a power cut. Um, but you fumble around in the darkness, don't you? You fumble around and you're looking for either a, uh, a match for a candle or a torch that you've got somewhere. Um, but then humans don't really like the darkness, do they? You know, as a child, I never really liked the darkness. I can remember um, when we lived in uh, Station Road, my bedroom was at the back of the house. And, uh, of course, Tris was at the end of the corridor and then there was another sort of corridor to mum and dad's room. And I always remember um, sneaking into Triss's bed some nights and, you know, snuggling in at the bottom because I was afraid of the dark if I woke up. Um, but so childs don't like the, the, the dark, do they? Um, but it's funny, isn't it? It cheers, doesn't it? It cheers because when you, you find that candle or that torch, you, immediately you feel better because you can see what you're doing. You know, it cheers, doesn't it? The light cheers. And if we turn back to Genesis, we turn to Genesis, and the first command is, is what? And God said, let there be light. Let there be light. It was God's first command. Do we see how significant this is? I mean, without light, the the world would be a gloomy blank space, wouldn't it? It would be very gloomy, wouldn't it? So we are to be light, aren't we? Are we true Christians? If we're true Christians, we must remember our position and our responsibility, mustn't we? We must remember that. Do we ever, do we ever look at our own hearts and, and weep at our own hearts? Because our own hearts are wretched. But then do we look at our own hearts and then rejoice in the Lord for what he has done for us? It's a wonderful thing. What he has done for us. He has, he has washed us. Washed us. Clean. So then to sum it up. To sum it up. So what do we learn from these two figures? Yeah, salt and light. There must be something marked, mustn't there? There must be something distinct in us. Something peculiar. Peculiar, aren't we? But there must be something peculiar about our characters. 
as true Christians, it, it's, it's, not, it's not good, is it, to be idle in going about our lives as the world does. Thinking and living as others do. We must have Christ as our centre, especially if we are in him. If we're, we want to be owned by him as his people, we must walk with him, mustn't we? We must walk with him. Have we grace? Then it has to be seen, doesn't it? It has to be seen. Have we the Holy Spirit? Have we the Holy Spirit? Then there must be fruit. There must be fruit. We should throw off religion. Throw off religion. Because with the Spirit comes a change of mind, doesn't it? With the Spirit comes a change of mind. There's a difference between us and the world, isn't there? There's a big difference. A big difference. Because we have life. We have life. A true Christian is something more than being baptised and going to church, isn't it? Salt and light imply that true Christians have a change of heart, don't they? A change of heart. David says, isn't he, create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. A change of life for Christ. And, and that should be shown as a life of faith, isn't it? A life of faith. And faith that's put into practice. Faith that is put into practice. Must we dare to be singular? Christians, we, we don't like being uh, scorned by the world, do we? But that is our mission for us because we are going through the narrow road. We are going through the narrow road as Christians if we mean to be saved. So, this morning, are you coming to church as your duty? Or have you seen your sin? Have you seen your sin? Have you seen your need of a saviour? Do you love him? If you love him this morning, then come to him. Because all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that is wonderful, isn't it? Wonderful. Amen. Amen. So, our final hymn. And it actually happens to be one of my favourites as well. Um, but it is about the Christian walk and our pilgrimage, and it's 788 who would true valour see. <laughs> 788.